Chapter 1 Ambush David John Slaughter leaned against the open window of the red four-door Jeep Wrangler, enjoying the summer breeze and the view. No one had ever referred to him by his given name, however. As far back as he could remember, he had always gone by DJ. With one hand on the steering wheel and the other hanging out of the driver's side window, DJ sat relaxed, guiding the four-wheel drive along the mountain path that was effectively his driveway. For two miles, the gravel path meandered, twisting and snaking its way along a thin mountain stream. Behind him sat his cabin, nestled deep in the boxed canyon. Ahead of him, somewhere still out of view, was the road that connected him to civilization. He loved it out here, a quiet retreat from the world, an angry world that had robbed him of his family and left him searching for a reason to live. He never did find that reason out here, but he did find a peaceful existence. His isolated cabin set far away from a world of angry people and complexity. As he drove along, breathing in the southern Colorado air, he began to consider the path that had brought him full circle to where he was now. He started his life here, in Colorado. He had left it for a time, but now found himself returned to his roots. His was not the story of a prodigal son's return, however. It was decidedly more tragic. His father had died when he was a teenager, and his mother worked three jobs just to make ends meet. DJ had always considered her a supermom. Without his father in the picture, his mother became his everything. At 18, everything changed. A car accident stole her away from him. DJ was devastated. He dropped out of the high school he attended in Boulder and joined the Navy on a waiver in an attempt to run away from life. He didn't quite make it four years as a corpsman when a nasty tumble down the side of a hill in Iraq left him with a steel plate in his head and a medical discharge. What would have been another sudden and tragic detour a real blessing? It was lying in a bed at a Navy hospital in Virginia where he met his future wife. Cassie was a volunteer at the hospital, a modern-day candy striper that showed up on the weekends to help where she could. As far as he was concerned, <laughs> it was love at first sight. As far as she was concerned, he was just another soldier that needed cheering up. DJ was persistent, though, and soon she fell in love, too. After less than a year of dating, they married, and he moved her back to her hometown in Oklahoma. As he saw it, he had nothing to move back to Colorado for. Oklahoma was just as good a place as any. For a few years, he stayed kind of directionless as far as a job was concerned, living off his meager medical pension, until he was talked into trying options trading by a friend at church. He soon learned that he could see patterns in the chaos of the stock market and developed a real knack for it. In a few more years, they had a nice house, a really nice bank account, and they had a nice house a really nice bank account, and two beautiful twin girls that became his and Cassie's whole reason for existing. Lindsay and Kelsey were only two years old when the evils of this world directed their attention to his family. Life ambushed him. Again. Only this time, it was worse. It forever changed him, leaving him a broken and bitter man. He was snapped out of the wanderings of his mind by a spine-jarring bump in the winding gravel road. It nearly ripped the steering wheel from his hand, severely upsetting the vehicle, and he reflexively grabbed the wheel with his left in order to correct the jeep's direction. He slammed the brakes and skidded to a halt. Shifting in reverse, he backed up and leaned out of the window to see what had nearly thrown him from the road. Rain runoff from last night's storm funneled off the side of the steep valley walls. It had cut a deep but narrow channel across the gravel road, heading to the creek that snaked its way along the valley on his right. Sunlight hit from view, the road from view. If he'd have hit it any harder, he would have been ejected from the road and into the creek below. He would have to get that fixed. That would involve recreating a runoff path beneath the road through some heavy gauge PVC and burying it back below the gravel. That meant he would need a new battery for the tractor he hadn't started since last year. He might as well pick one up while he was in town. And just like that, there went his weekend. Nothing like finding an odd job that needed completing on a Friday afternoon. He was hoping to spend his Saturday doing something far more relaxing than rebuilding a section of road. Making the last bend at the end of the canyon, he was greeted by the narrow two-lane blacktop that was Highway 160. He pulled through the split rail fence that marked the border to his property, over the cattle guard, and paused at the road. Looking both ways, he took a left, heading into South Fork. 
South Fork was a small town in lower Colorado. It's set in the intersection of two wide valleys and along the banks of banks of two merging mountain rivers that met right in the heart of town. The Rio Grande cut east and west through the mountains, the very same Rio Grande that eventually turned and snaked its way south to become the border between Texas and Mexico. It was met with a smaller tributary coming in from the south, aptly named the South Fork Rio Grande. Locals just referred to it as the South Fork. It was along the latter that he now drove. It was about as picturesque a place as you could find, a small town in size, with the atmosphere to go along with it. It was here that he picked up supplies once or twice a month, checked his mail at a mail store once or twice a week, and occasionally had a bite to eat at a small diner known as Uncle Henry's. Henry, the proprietor of the diner, was the closest thing to a friend DJ had. They were friendly, but not close. The aging black man would serve him his pan-fried trout caught fresh from the South Fork that ran behind the diner on the southern edge of town. They would talk about the weather in town. They would talk about the weather and fishing. How much snow were they going to get come winter? How Henry's wife was currently faring and perfecting her homemade pickle recipe. About how DJ was doing with his growing gun collection and what his most recent purchase was. But that was about it. Henry knew nothing about DJ's past, sensing that was an area off topic. And DJ, well, he never volunteered anything. After tragedy stole his family, DJ felt he had nothing left to live for and found little comfort in associating with the few friends and family he had left. He had made friends at the small church they had attended in Oklahoma, plus Cassie's parents still lived there. But while they all did their best to help him cope with the loss of his wife and kids, every time he saw their faces, he was only reminded of that loss admired him in sadness that eventually morphed into anger and bitterness. One day, while checking his email, he saw a spam ad for acreage in Colorado from the state. He impulsively clicked on it. The expansive property seemingly far away from civilization and all the evils that came along with it pulled on him. Suddenly, he just wanted to run away. Run away from life. Run away from people. Just like he had wanted to run away after his mother's death. Within a few weeks, he had sold his house and everything in it, both of the cars, and he boarded a one-way flight to Denver. He caught a ride off of one of those ride-sharing apps to a Jeep dealership and paid cash for the Red Wrangler he drove now. The next day, he met with a realtor that drove him out to a sprawling 6,800-acre piece of property that stretched along a deep, high-walled valley and ended in a box canyon. It was labeled a ranch, but one could tell it had never functioned at such. It contained a nearly 140-year-old abandoned gold mine, a decaying gravel road that stretched to a falling-down old hunter's cabin, and its own fresh mountain stream from a natural spring. It was surrounded by national forest. It was about as isolated as you could get without being on another planet, but still within driving distance to the nearby town of South Fork, offering a source of supplies. DJ signed the paperwork that afternoon, paid cash for it all. It cut his bank account nearly half. But he had done well in the market, however, and had nothing else to really spend his money on, so he really didn't care. He contracted someone to build a small, two-story house on piers, and had it outfitted with solar and wind power, so it was totally off the grid. He even had a water catch system installed with a cistern. He put in a satellite for internet, and as long as he kept the snow off of it in the winter, the connection was plenty fast enough for anything he would want to do. It was quiet, remote, and peaceful but still not enough to keep the pain and the anger away. One day, about three months after completing the house, and with nothing else left to occupy his thoughts, his grief, and his anger, he had finally overtook him. He had purchased a rifle right after acquiring the property, a heavy caliber bolt-action savage with a scope. The realtor had advised it on account of bears that roamed the area. It had never been fired. He took the rifle, sat down in a chair on the porch, placed one round in the chamber, and then placed the stock on the ground. After putting the barrel in his mouth, he could barely reach the trigger, but it was enough. He closed his eyes, applied pressure to the trigger, and nothing. Taking the gun out of his mouth, he picked it up to look closer at the trigger. He pulled the trigger again, but it simply would not budge. Was it defective? He looked even closer and noticed that the safety was on. <laughs> the sheer lunacy of not at first realizing that it might be switched to safe caused him to laugh out loud. 
He pushed the safety off and tested the trigger again with it still resting in his lap. The rifle exploded with light volume. The rifle exploded with light volume and pure violence. It leapt from his hands and clattered onto the flooring of the porch. All the normal sounds associated with his remote cabin retreat instantly vanished to be replaced by a severe ringing in his ears. He jerked both hands furtively over his ears as if that would somehow help. He was aware that he cursed out loud and even knew exactly what he said, but he could not hear his own voice. He could only hear the ringing in his ears that seemed to stab him directly in his brain. He stood up and kicked at the rifle as hard as he could, cursing yet again. He missed, lost his balance, and fell backwards into the chair. Then, cursing yet a third time, he slowly leaned forward over his knees and began to cry. Cassie would not have approved of his language, no matter the circumstances. For that matter, she would not have approved of him taking his own life. But he missed her so much. He missed them all so much. The pain nodded in his... It was simply more than he could bear. Cassie, he sobbed, I'm so sorry. The tears drained from his face and dripped non-stop onto the rifle at his feet. Over and over again he repeated his apology to his dead wife. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. After a long while, the sobbing slowed, eventually stopping altogether. As he sat there, with his red eyes focused downward at the rifle at his feet, and with his hearing still somewhat impaired, he fussed at himself. <laughs> if I'm going to shoot myself in the head, at least I should know a bit more about the last act I'll ever do. It was a misconception to assume that anyone in the military must know a lot about firearms. That was not necessarily true. In DJ's case, he was a corpsman. His primary focus was on patching a soldier up and keeping them alive long enough for them to make it back to an actual doctor. To an focus was on patching a soldier up and keeping them alive long enough for them to make it back to an actual doctor. And while he carried the same never basic rifleman would carry, and could shoot it with reasonable skill, it was never really much of a focus for his job classification. Aside from that one rifle he was outfitted with in the Navy, he had never fired another gun in his life. Over the next few days, he scoured the internet, learning all he could about guns and shooting. A mild curiosity rapidly turned into something for him to really focus on, something that could occupy his thoughts. The desire to blow his brains out faded into the background, replaced by a new hobby. Just like had happened with the options trading on the stock market, he began to see patterns in the things he was reading about online. He saw the mechanics and engineering behind the art of shooting. He learned the human requirements for being proficient. He watched videos on the internet to learn not only about the act of shooting, but about the science behind the weapons themselves. He ordered books off of Amazon written by and about famous marksmen. He purchased technically the things he had begun to acquire a rather extensive collection of firearms and most of the things associated with them. Some he purchased from the sporting goods store in town. Some he bought used. He discovered a website that was essentially like a Craigslist for guns. There, he would find people in his own state that were selling their used weapons. If he spotted one he was interested in, he would contact them by email and then phone, arrange for a neutral meeting place, and pay them cash for the weapon if it met his expectations. To date, he now owned over 75 various rifles, pistols, and shotguns. He even had a well-equipped shop to service them all and reload ammo. It was a recent add-on to the cabin last year. Previously, he had been using the second bedroom upstairs, but he had run out of space for his collection and all of his gear and tools. He had specifically hired a contractor from outside of the state to add it to the house for secrecy. He paid the man cash to avoid a permit and inspection by the state. Along the avoid a permit and inspection by the state. It ran along the entire back side of the house and contained a secret room for storage. There, he hid most of his collection. It was for this new hobby he was now coming to town. A while back, he had found a guy that was wanting to sell a high-end, small-caliber pistol. It was a beautiful handmade job worth nearly three grand. Apparently, it was left to him by his grandfather. He met the guy at the end of a department store parking lot and paid cash for it on the spot. A couple of days ago, the same guy reached out to him yet again. He said he had a friend wanting to get rid of his whole collection because he was hard up for cash. His wife had come down with cancer. He needed the money. 
The collection included a mix of some real heirlooms and some newer, more modern weapons. One of those was a hand-fitted military-grade sniper rifle. It was a platform that would run almost $4,000 by itself, and DJ began to drool as saw the pictures. In total, it was nearly $20,000 worth of firearms for half the price. It was a deal too good to pass up. So, DJ said sure once more. This guy even agreed to drive down from just north of Breckenridge to make the exchange. Plus, he sounded like he might even be able to be talked down off his price, as he was just that desperate. Not that DJ was going to try and chew him down, seeing that he was trying to save the life of his wife. That just didn't seem right. In fact, DJ was considering paying him more. A quick glance at his watch told him he was early, so he'd have time to run a few errands first. He drove past Uncle Henry's diner on the right as he entered town. The meat would be in the parking lot there. He figured he could catch something to eat afterwards, and maybe Henry would have a jar of the latest batch of pickles from his wife. He turned left onto Highway 149 in the middle of town and then pulled into the auto parts store for that battery. The place was empty except for the pimply-faced young man. DJ figured the kid could not have been more than 19. He barely looked up from fiddling with his phone. Hey, man, Pimple Face said, not bothering to stand. DJ merely nodded and headed to the battery display to make his selection. He settled on one a bit larger than he needed and made his way back to the counter. Pimple Face slowly stood and started the process to ring him up. You got one to trade? Pimple Face asked. Nope, just this, DJ replied. Okay, well, it's going to cost you ten bucks more if you ain't got one to recycle. The red tint of the whites of Pimple Face's eyes, along with the slight sweet smell DJ picked up from being so close, gave it away that he was freely partaking of Colorado's legalization of marijuana, although he certainly seemed too young to make the purchase himself. Understood. DJ reached into the left breast pocket of his gray work shirt and produced a small wad of bills. He waited patiently for Pimple Face to finish selecting the right combination of buttons on his terminal. On the counter to his right was the bills. He waited patiently for Pimple Face to finish selecting the right combination of buttons on his terminal. On the counter to his right was a cylindrical display for sunglasses containing an assortment of choices. The mirror used for checking yourself out was facing his direction and he couldn't help but see himself. He winced at the image staring back at him. A scraggly brown beard showing no signs of being trimmed in a long while covered a large portion of his face and neck. Equally scraggy tufts of brown hair poked out from the edges of his camouflaged ball cap. He looked every part the gun-collecting backwoods redneck that he was slowly turning into. Cassie would not have approved of his hair-covered face. She loved it right after he shaved in the morning. And just like that, he was not standing at the counter of an auto parts store. He was standing in a steamy bathroom with a towel wrapped around his waist, looking down into the green eyes of his wife. She was grinning up at him, caressing his newly shaven face. He could hear the girls playing. A child's giggle softly made its way to his ears, and his wife grinned deepened even more. Sir? Hey, sir? Sir, are you okay? The moment was gone ambushed by a pimply-faced teenager in an auto parts store with bloodshot eyes and a manager's badge pinned to his shirt. Um, that'll be ninety-three fifty-two. Keep the change, DJ snapped, dropping a hundred-dollar bill on the counter. He snatched up the battery and quickly made his way through the front door and away from the shocked look of young Mr. Pimply-faced. With still time left before his meeting, he drove next to the mail store, aptly named The Mail Store. It was run by a grizzled old veteran named Mike. He sort of reminded DJ of an angry version of Santa Claus. White hair on his head, a white beard to match, <laughs> and a rotund belly around his middle. But the similarities were purely physical. He was short with his customers, opinionated about politics which he eagerly opinionated about politics which he eagerly shared with anyone that would listen, and had about as much patience as a toddler in need of nappy time. Got a box for you. He snapped. What do your boxes always weigh so much? You're going to have to come around and get it yourself. He pointed his thumb over his shoulder to indicate where the box was stashed. DJ nodded and went around the counter. He found his and a stack of other customers' packages and picked it up. In Mike's defense, it was indeed on the heavy side. Judging from the logo on the side, it was a thousand rounds of 9mm ammo he had ordered last week. He tended to reload most of the other calibers himself, but he found a place online that had pretty good remanufactured nine for cheaper than he could make it. 
Mike watched him carry it back around the counter. What you got in there? He asked with a growl. Bullets, DJ flatly replied, not bothering to keep it a secret. Got a coyote problem. That's a lot of ammo for a few coyotes. Looked at him with, looked at him with unmasked disdain. I just could never pass up a good sale. Got anything else for me? Just what's in your wall box. Mike turned around and flipped on a TV mounted on the wall. A popular cable news channel instantly filled the air with the latest goings-on in the world. What'd you think about the latest crap your government just pulled? Mike asked over his shoulder, his attention now firmly on the TV. Bunch of crap for sure, DJ replied. Truthfully, he had no idea what Mike was talking about and he really didn't want to know. He set the box down on the floor and fished his keys out from his jeans pocket. He quickly located his mailbox along the wall and unlocked it, finding a letter with a handwritten address. It was a letter from Cassie's mom. He stared at it for a long few seconds, then folded it over and shoved it into the left back pocket next to his wallet. He picked up his box and without even saying goodbye to Mike, who was now firmly fixated on the news, headed back to the jeep. He hoped the meeting with the gun seller would go down quick. He was starving. It was now 3 p.m. and still pretty early for supper, but he had skipped lunch because of a late breakfast. His stomach was starting to think his throat had been cut. He smiled at that thought. It was a line from a set of Louis L'Amour westerns he had read when he was a kid. It wasn't quite that bad yet, but he was indeed starting to get hungry. The diner parking lot was just a large patch of gravel with no clear entrance or exit. One could simply pull off the road at any angle and find a spot to stop anywhere. As he approached it from the north, he quickly spotted a white late model pickup parked facing the road. It was angled perfect for an easy exit and parked right next to the blacktop. A young man was standing next to the driver's door smoking a cigarette. He was wearing jeans and a short sleeve button-up, untucked and over the top of some sort of dark printed t-shirt. On his head was a khaki ball cap. Was a khaki ball cap. He was a white guy, clean shaven, except for a strip of black hair stretching from his bottom lip to the base of his chin. What'd they call that? A soul patch? Regardless, he matched the description the seller gave him over the phone. DJ waved as he pulled past, stopped the jeep parallel to the road, and aimed it back towards the direction of home. He figured he would meet the guy, take a look at the guns, and then back the jeep up to the tailgate if he was happy with what he saw. He didn't expect there would be an issue, however. He had already been emailed pictures of all seven weapons, and he was really looking forward to making this deal. As he stepped out, he left the engine running and the door open, and began walking back towards Mr. Soulpatch. Soulpatch's face lit up with a big smile and started making his way toward him. You must be the guy I'm looking for, Soulpatch said. As he drew closer, he extended his hand to shake. DJ smiled back and met his hand with his own. He instantly re me, like a sick person's. If you're the seller, then I'm the buyer, DJ replied. Releasing the handshake, he casually wiped his hand against the leg of his jeans. What'd you say your name was again? Soul Patch looked around as he asked, checking out the parking lot like he was nervous. Being a bit nervous made perfect sense to DJ. After all, the guy had some valuable weapons likely stretched out in the back of the truck under the bed cover. He was probably a bit concerned with being robbed. That made the way he was dressed make more sense as well. He was no doubt concealing a handgun underneath that button-up he was wearing like a jacket. And DJ understood completely. He had made deals like this a few times before, had his own Glock 19 tucked under his shirt for protection. He had obtained his concealed carry permit some time back, and in this part of the country... If you exercised your Second Amendment rights, odds are you had a permit yourself. Both parties bringing one to a deal like this was just par for the course. It was both perfectly yourself. Both parties bringing one to a deal like this was just par for the course. It was both perfectly legal and completely understandable. So far, this deal was going down just like every other purchase before it. Sam, the name is Sam, DJ lied. He never gave his real name just to be on the safe side. He glanced around the parking lot as well. Henry's truck was parked on the north side of the building facing them. He could clearly see the silhouette of a shotgun in the gun rack. Aside from that, there was no one else here. The evening customers would be coming in soon and along with them, the one waitress that worked both the breakfast and dinner crowds. The lunch group was small enough that Henry worked the place by himself. But right now, the place was empty. 
So let's see what you got, DJ stated. He started to walk around Soul Patch and head towards the truck. Soul Patch sidestepped to move in front of him, holding both hands up in a stop right there sort of motion. No offense, buddy, but I got a lot riding on this. Did you bring the cash? Her nature. You bet, DJ replied, still smiling. He reached around behind him and produced a fat envelope from his right back pocket. Right here. He patted the envelope reassuringly with his other hand. So, can we take a look? Soulpatch looked at the envelope for a second, then, dropping his hand, smiled again. Sorry about that, just kind of nervous. DJ returned the envelope to his back pocket and followed Soulpatch around to the back of the truck. You know, Soulpatch lamented, I've heard about people getting robbed doing this kind of thing. I know you already bought a gun off my friend, but still. He folded the bed cover back and dropped the tailgate down but not before DJ got a look at the license plate, causing alarm bells in his head to go off. Hang on a sec. I thought you said you drove down from the other side of Breckenridge. Soulpatch looked blankly at him before replying. Uh, what, what are you talking about? Your license plate says Missouri. Another fl flat plate says Missouri. Another flat stare before replying. Oh, yeah, well, I bought this one used from a guy yesterday. I had to sell the new one we had, you know, because of needing money for my wife. I, I promise I'm from Colorado. I know selling across state lines is illegal. The nervous nature of Mr. Soul Patch was back, and beads of sweat were beginning to form above his upper lip. Those alarm bells were now ringing even louder. DJ had one more question for him, but he already knew he would not like the answer. So why does the plate read Porsche Lover? Yet another flat stare before speaking. Um, uh, what? Wrong answer.